Okay. Okay, so I guess it is three o'clock, so I suppose we can start probably. Uh, uh, have you all got a copy uh, of the Sutta uh, for today? Uh, yeah? Majjhima Nikaya 61. Uh, I'm going to start off by explaining to you why I'm doing this particular sutta, uh, uh, because um, there's some interesting information about this sutta. Well, one of the reasons is because it hasn't been done before, I think. I think it's, the, it's one of the few suttas that hasn't been done before. Uh, that's obviously a reason. Uh, uh, but another reason is that this sutta uh, also exists in Chinese translation as well. Uh, it exists in Pali and exists in Chinese. Uh, and one of the fascinating things is that very recently... Uh, some of these Chinese suttas have been translated into English. And this is the, the first volume of the Chinese Madhyama Agama. Madhyama Agama is the Sanskrit term for Madhyama Nikaya, Madhyama Agama. That exists in Chinese, and this is the translation from Chinese into English. And this particular collection has this particular sutta in it. So you can actually compare. You can compare the, the Chinese, if you like, with the, with the Pali. It's very fascinating here. And... Um, what you find, of course, is which is so reassuring in a sense, is that when you read the this this one and compare it to this one, it's almost exactly the same, very very similar. And when you think about that, it's actually quite astonishing because uh, the Chinese comes from a completely different lineage from the Pali. The Chinese goes back to what is called the uh, Sarvastivadin sect of Buddhism, which was one of the major sects in India at the time. And the Samastivadins, they were in North India, and they went to North India about the time of Ashoka, which is about 250 BC, right? And at the same time, that's also when Buddhism went to Sri Lanka, because that also happened in the Ashokan period. So these different lineages have been separated for like 2,200, 2,300 years. And part of that period is like the oral period, period of oral transmission. And when people hear about oral transmission, they think, oh yeah, oral, there must be lots of mistakes, right? Because it's oral transmission. But actually what you find is that the oral transmission in those days was very, very accurate. And the reason for that is because they had the Vedic precedent, the, you know, the Vedas, that were spoken orally in the Brahmanical tradition. And they had a whole system for how to transmit things orally very precisely over long, long periods of time. Uh, the most original of the Vedas, the Rig Veda, was transmitted orally for hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years, and very, very t tiny, tiny mistakes crept in, even over that long period. Yeah. So what you find then is precisely, when you make this comparison, is that it is incredibly accurate even after that kind of separation. Yeah. And that is um, quite astonishing, and uh, it gives you, to me at least, it gives me very strong confidence that what we have <coughs> today in the Pali Canon, is basically the word of the Buddha, right? Uh, you wouldn't be able to keep it so accurate for 2,300 years, uh, and then the first 100 years or 150 years, uh, it would have been completely you know, made up or completely random. That doesn't make any sense. You, you know, the fact that it's been kept so well over such a long period of time means that in all likelihood, it would have been kept very intact also for the very first part of Buddhist history, you know, 100 years, 150 years between the Buddha and the time of Ashoka. So that is, that is one reason I thought this sutta is particularly interesting. Yeah? And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll, have a, I'll read you a few passages from this one as well, so you can get the feeling for the similarities. And the other thing, reason why this sutta is interesting yeah, is that uh, I'm sure probably many of you have heard of the Ashokan Pillars. Have you ever heard of Ashokan Pillars? Anybody has not heard of the Ashokan Pillars? Yeah? Okay, the Ashokan Pillars is the... Ashoka was the most famous emperor ever in India. And he ruled over the entire India. This was in about 250 BC. And he was, he was a Buddhist. He was the only one of the few. Actually, there were a few afterwards as well. Uh, but he was the most powerful ever of the Buddhist emperors of, of India in 250 BC. And he had these big pillars, these stone pillars planted around in India. And on these stone pillars, he would inscribe what are known as the Ashokan Edicts. This is how he, you know, he would say something to the population, you know, be nice, you know, be nice to each other. And he, he would say, that in particular what he would say was the things that he was doing, right? I'm feeding, helping the animals and digging wells for the people, travelers and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that he did in one of these pillars is that he, he wrote down the kind of texts that Buddhists should study. 
right? So he wrote seven Buddhist texts that people should study. Uh, and one of those texts is this particular sutta here, the, uh, in here. Uh, that is actually found on the Ashokan pillars. So there's very, you know, the archaeological evidence is right there that this sutta existed at the time of the Buddha. So again, very, uh, very good. Huh? Quite interesting that this sutta actually is there. So you can probably see it on this, I think you can probably see it in this day and age if you go to the right place, you can go and read. If you can read the ancient um, Brahmanical script, then you should be able to read it in India. It's quite, it's quite neat, isn't it? <laughs> you go there and you see this ancient script and it says the same thing. It's quite, a, it's sort of, wow. Yeah, at least it, to me it's very, quite powerful. Okay, any questions about that? Yes, Hui Tong, yeah. 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 Uh, there is. There are. I mean, there are doctrinal differences between the schools, uh, but those doctrinal differences are, are evolved after the early te evolved later on, right? Uh, and that's why they became different schools, uh, precisely because uh, they had different doctrines. So uh, the Sarvastivadin are very famous for the doctrine Sarv Sarvastivadin, quite literally means the ones who have the doctrine that all exists. Sarva, Sabba, Asti, all exist doctrine. Huh? And um, so their, their idea, the, the thing which is special about them is that they had this idea that Dhammas, Dhammas are like the fundamental thing in the Abhidhamma, right? A Dhamma is like the building blocks of existence according to the, according to the Abhidhamma. So everything can be broken down into Dhammas. And uh, they had this idea that Dhammas exist in the past, present and future. Huh? That was their kind of thing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true, and I think that, you know, even though this is, um, that, that doctrinal difference is there, it is mostly in later texts, so it depends on how seriously you take those later texts. So those people who went back to the word of the Buddha would hardly be affected at all by, by that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. this is precisely that that's what is so, so astonishing here, yeah, so amazing about it. Mm. Any other questions about that before we, uh, before we start with the sutta? Yeah. No, okay. So let's um, let's start with the sutta. So, the word of the Buddha. The, so now that now that we know it's the word of the Buddha, it's even more exciting, isn't it? Now it's really here. Yeah, we can really get into this. Okay. So Majjhimarika sixty-one, Ambalattika Rahula Vada Sutta. The advice to Rahula at Ambalattika, and Rahula, of course, was the Buddha's son. Uh, and he ordained when he was very young, when he was a novice. And Ambalatika is a place near Rajagaha. Rajagaha, of course, being one of the main centers of Buddhism in India at the time, uh, south of the Ganges River, south of what is now Patna, or Pataliputra in those days. Uh. Okay, so let's just uh, <coughs> start. And pl please, whenever, if you want to ask questions as we go along, please do so. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. Now on that occasion the Venerable Rahula was living at Ambalatika. Then, when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to the Venerable Rahula at Ambalatika. The Venerable Rahula saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and made a seat ready and set out water for washing the feet. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The Venerable Rahula paid homage to him and sat down at one side. So just a very simple little observation which is a, a kind of interesting here, this idea that the Buddha washes his own feet, right? It's not the sort of thing that you normally think of, but this is actually what he does. So the, um, a lot of the kind of later myths about the Buddha are so often so exaggerated. Huh? But he was actually, a very, in many ways, he was a very kind of humble and, and ordinary monk. He, does, he wasn't kind of over, over um, kind of protected by people around him. Today, if you go to many Asian countries, you will have lay people, if you're a monk, lay people will often wash your feet for you. Huh? So even the Buddha didn't have that, right? So it's, it's kind of, it's a bit embarrassing if the Buddha had to wash his own feet, but you get your feet washed. It's, ooh, maybe. <laughs> okay, so that is, uh, is an interesting little point. And then the Buddha gives the following teaching to Rahula. 
Then the Blessed One left a little water in the water vessel and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this little water left in the water vessel? Yes, Venerable Sir, even so, even so little, Rahula, is the recluseship of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. So, interesting here, the uh, lying is so bad according to this that if you uh, lie, then basically uh, your, re your recluseship, in other words, your monkhood or, or your nunhood if you're a nun, or uh, you know, your samanaship, uh, it's the samanaship which actually is the, word, pal the Pali word here, is basically it's nothing, right? There's just a little bit of water left in the vessel, it's this empty kind of thing here. So that's for lying. So why? How, how come lying is considered so bad? I mean, you think, you know, maybe killing living beings, right, or stealing would be bad, but what about lying? Why is that so bad? And um, the first thing I think to notice here is that this is uh, talking about uh, deliberate lying, right? So what does it mean to deliberately lie? And uh, to, uh, obviously it means that it's very, it's something that you, know you're doing, right? You're doing it deliberate. It's not something you speak too fast and you say the wrong thing or anything like that. But it's a very deliberate act. And it's interesting to note that how this is described in the Vinaya, the Vinaya for monastics. These things are defined in very great detail, what these things mean. And a deliberate lie is not a very grave offense according to the Vinaya, but it is still, the way it is described is very illuminating. It says that you know before you're going to speak that you are going to lie here. You know while you're speaking that you're lying here. And you know when you're finished that you have lied afterwards. So it's very clear what you're doing, right? It's not as if you just speak a little bit too fast and think, wait, wait a minute, that wasn't really true, was it? But that, that is not a deliberate lie. It's you know exactly what you're doing. It's a very deliberate thing. And this gives you some idea that what, what is actually meant here. It's a very clear statement. And that is when it gets very bad, when you're very conscious of what you're doing. And that is the first thing. The second thing about deliberate lying, it also depends on your motivation, right? Everything in Buddhism is about motivation. Intention is what uh, is, is the create, is what is the, the crucial thing which makes something moral or immoral. So if you are motivated in a bad way, that's when it's really bad. But if your motivation is coming from something relatively positive, then it's not so bad. So if you are truly motivated by compassion when you lie, you know, usually you don't have to lie. Usually you can find ways around it. You don't have to get you into that difficult position. But if you are truly motivated by compassion, if you feel that somebody cannot take what you're about to say, and you, well, there, are, there are always some extreme examples you hear about, uh, then, if you really are motivated by compassion, then it's not going to be very bad to lie, right? What is your intention? What is your motivation? What is the driving force? Is it greed? Is it anger? Is it delusion? Is your mind clouded? It is in these cases that this is very uh, particularly bad. I think Ajahn Brahm tells a story of a woman in, who was in hospital and her husband had had some kind of open was going to have some kind of open heart surgery or something like that. Uh, and open heart surgery is a quite a risky thing, right? I mean, there's, there's a quite a fairly high percentage of uh, people who die and you know, don't make it through that. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how high, maybe 5% or something. And um, then uh, th there was a fellow next to him, sitting in the bed, ne bed next to him, who's going to have the same operation. And he went in first. Have you heard this story, Hutong? Yeah? He went in first, uh, and then uh, uh, he didn't make it. He died during the operation. Uh, and then his wife comes to visit the man and he asks him, well, what happened to my friend that I you know, made contact with over the last few days? Did he, how did he do in his heart surgery here? And the wife said something like, oh, he did all right, <laughs> or something like that, right? It was a deliberate lie. But you can imagine in that sort of situation, if you hear that your friend has just died and you are kind of on the operating table the next day, right? Whoa, it's pretty scary here. So you can see in that sort of situation, I don't think lying is very bad because it is basically driven by compassion, a sense of you, you don't want to uh, you know, upset the person, you want to give him the maximum chances of survival, basically. So that is not a bad type of lying. But even then, maybe there's something you can say to not, not have to lie, I'm not sure. But in that case, it's not so bad. So this is again, where are you coming from? Why are you doing this? Is the essential thing here. So it's a deliberate lie, and we'll see later on that it actually is based on unwholesome states. That's when it's bad.
So this is the first thing about this. This is what makes lying bad. And, and the second thing you will notice here, which makes it bad, is that you are not ashamed of it, right? You'd make a deliberate lie, and you sort of shrug your shoulders, and you're, you're kind of not too worried about it, right? And that is what is bad. And this is one of the things that you find, they, they say that once you become an Aryan, once you become a stream enter, they say that your morality is perfect. And that doesn't mean that you don't make any mistakes, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything wrong. But what it means is precisely that, that you have a sense of shame about what you've done, and you will confess it straight away afterwards. That's what perfect morality means. It doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you don't do immoral acts. It means you, have, you, are, you feel that this is wrong and you confess it straight away. Yeah. You have a sense of shame. The Pali word here is actually lajja or lajji. And uh, it can be translated as maybe conscience is another way of translating it. You feel a sense of conscience. No, that was wrong. Yeah. I shouldn't do that. Yeah. And then you confess it to move forward. Yeah. So these are the two important factors to understand here. Yeah. And what makes lying bad? You're not ashamed about it. Yeah. So in other words, there's no chance you're going to change, right? And the second thing, you are, it's very deliberate what you're doing here. Yeah. These are the two important uh, things. Uh, and when you do that, then uh, the lying becomes bad. And it's interesting, in another place in the suttas, uh, uh, the Buddha says that if a, a person has no problem with lying, if you have no, you know, if lying, like in this case, unashamedly in this sense, uh, then there is no bad act, he says, uh, that you cannot do. Uh, in other words, it's, this is a kind of, a, this shamelessness is something which basically then is kind of um, permeates your personality and you can do bad things in any, any particular way if you do it, in, uh, if you can lie shamelessly like this. Uh. And that is why the Buddha says, uh, your, your recluse ship is hollow, right? Uh, you're going in the opposite direction of what it means to be a samana, to be an ascetic, if you can lie in this way. Yeah. It is just like the little water in the water vessel. Everybody ma make sense to everybody? Yeah? Yeah? Yes, John. Yeah. That is, that's a good question. I, I don't know. What, it, it, would, it almost sounds like it, doesn't it? That he has done something dodgy. Well, otherwise, why does he speak like this to him? You know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I think the commentary said something about that. It said something that he had been kind of messing around or joking around a bit too much or something. Uh, and later on in this sutta, it says that uh, you should not even tell a lie as a joke, right? Uh, so maybe he had kind of been, been joking around a bit too much and messing around. Uh, so about, we'll come to that later on there. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, did you say that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. They would have, you would have thought there would, have, would be some trigger or some reason why the Buddha would give him the teaching, unless Rahula was just the person who had, there was many other people in the audience perhaps, and that he was maybe addressing those, that's a possibility. Yeah. So, uh, he was very young, yeah, and young people often perhaps mess around a bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's very difficult to know exactly what, what is happening there. Yeah. Uh, but it's true, though. I mean, Rahula was uh, he later on is supposed to become an arahant very quite early on. So he obviously must have been very pure at the same time. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so and then the Buddha gives a couple of more similes uh, just to drive home the point. Then the Blessed One threw away the little water that was left and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see that little water? that was thrown away. Yes, Venerable Sir, even so, Rahula, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have thrown away their recluseship. Right? Thrown, you have thrown it away. In other words, it is, it is no longer, you're no longer a recluse, really, or an ascetic at that point. Then the Blessed One turned the water vessel upside down and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this water vessel turned upside down? Yes, Venerable Sir, even so, Rahula, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have turned their uh, monkhood upside down. 
And of course, not only your monk could, but if you are a lay disciple and you are kind of trying to practice, you will have turned that lay discipleship a bit upside down as well, right? So uh, either way, it is not good. Quite very strong similes here about the, the bad effect of lying without any kind of shame. Then the Blessed One turned the vessel right way up again and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this hollow, empty water vessel? Yes, Venerable Sir, even so, hollow and empty Rahula is the monkhood or nunhood of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. It's hollow, it's empty, there's nothing really there, there's nothing at the core. Suppose, Rahula, there were a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, uh, uh, full-grown in stature, high-bred and accustomed to battle. In battle he would perform his task with his forefeet and his hindfeet, uh, with his forequarters and his hindquarters, uh, with his head and his ears, uh, with his tusk and his tail, uh, yet he would keep back his trunk. Then his rider would think, this royal tusker elephant, with tusks as long as chariot poles, etc., performs his task in battle with his forefeet and hindfeet, etc., yet he keeps back his trunk. He has not yet given up his life. But when the royal tusker elephant performs his task in battle with his forefeet and his hindfeet, with his forequarters and his hindquarters, with his head and his ears, with his tusks and his tails, and also with his trunk, then his rider would think, this royal tusker elephant, with tusks as long as chariot pole, performs his task in battle with forefeet and hindfeet, and also with his trunk. He has given up his life. There is nothing this royal tusker elephant would not do. So too, Rahula, when one is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, there is no evil, I say, that one would not do. There you are, there's, there's the quote right there. There's no evil, I say, that one would not do. Therefore, Rahula, you should train thus. I will not utter a falsehood, even as a joke. So, it is like the elephant, he has given up his life because he will do whatever the rider tells him, right? Regardless of the consequences. He will not think of the consequences anymore. This is the issue here. The consequences are irrelevant. If I die, okay, that will just have to happen. In the same way, you lie, you don't think of the consequences. The, ma the mahout or the rider, uh, in that case, will be the defilements, right? The defilements of the mind are the rider that rides you, and they make you do whatever. You just follow the commands of the defilements regardless. Uh, and then you do that, you don't think of the consequences of your actions in the same way. Yeah? So it's a bit scary to being kind of having this, these defilements kind of... Uh, you know, in charge, isn't it? Sort of uh, riding us uh, and taking us around. Uh. Yeah, and then it says at the end, I will not utter falsehood even as a joke. And um, the Pali here, it seems to me, it means, it doesn't mean that you can't tell jokes. What it means is that you're not going to tell a lie and, and you know, make that lie into a joke, so to speak. I'm going to tell a lie, but not really, not seriously, and sort of laugh about it afterwards. That's what it means. It doesn't mean actually telling jokes. So, uh, I will not utter falsehood, even as a joke, means, means lying as a joke, yeah? rather than telling a joke, which includes uh, some obvious uh, untrue stories. Yeah? Okay. What do you think, Rahula? So now that's, that's the first part of the sutta, and now we move on to the second part. Uh, and uh, yeah, what do you think, Rahula? What is the purpose of a mirror? It is for the purpose of reflection, venerable sir. So too, Rahula, an action with a body should be done after repeated reflection. An action by speed should be done after repeated reflection. An action by the mind should be done after repeated reflection. So uh, it's a very high standard, right? You should actually reflect before you do anything. Is it, you know, is this going to be useful? Is, is it good? Is it bad? Is it what is it? Very high standard. Most of the time, we just speak. We just do stuff, and we don't really think properly often on the consequences or whether it's right or wrong. 
I like this idea, you should even reflect before you do an action of the mind, right? So you should think before you think, yeah. That's, what, <laughs> that's sort of what it means, right? <laughs> so, well, I, so, but that's, but that's uh, yeah. It sort, of, it sort of makes sense, I think, when you know what, he, what he's talking about here. Yeah. Even mental action you have to be careful with. Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with the body lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both? Right? This is a standard kind of idea of what is wholesome in Buddhism. If it leads to somebody's affliction, then it's a bad act. Right? Is it an un- unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, it is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results, then you definitely should not do such an action with the body. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may do such an action with the body. So these are the standard ways in the Buddhist to decide whether something is good or bad, right? There's these two ways in Buddhism we talk, we, that we decide on whether something is moral or immoral. And one way is to look at the consequences it has for others. Is it going to be painful for others what I do, or for myself, or for both? It's in, just that little bit is already interesting. Why does it have for oneself, others, and both? It sounds like, isn't it enough to say just for oneself or others? And that's already interesting, because I think sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to be nice to others, but it's going to be bad for myself. But in this case, I'm going to sort of, you know, I'm going to be the martyr kind of thing, right? But the Buddha says, no, it's, you know, it's neither for the one, nor for the other, nor for both should it be bad. So it's, there's no such thing as in Buddhism as, I'm going to do, be a martyr, or this is going to be good for me, I don't care what happens to everybody else, that's the kind of the other one, right? It is both sides, and each one individually at the same time, and also the reverse about doing good actions. So this is, um, this is interesting. And then, the, so this is the first way of deciding whether something is moral. And the second way is to know whether you're coming from wholesome or unwholesome motivation when you do an act, right? Where am I coming from? And sometimes it can be very hard to know yourself that well, to know whether your motivation is entirely pure or not. How pure is a motivation? Often motivations are a bit kind of mixed, right? There's a little bit of purity there, a little bit of goodness, but there's also a little bit of kind of grayness and a bit of lack of clarity sometimes. So what you do is you do your best to move towards the pure, the wholesome action, and move away from the unwholesome ones. And because the mind is so mixed very often, because it's a mixture of different motivations and intentions in there, this idea that kamma is either black or white, that we normally hear about, uh, I think that's a mistaken understanding of kamma. Kamma is not either good or bad. This is what you learn when you grow up as a Buddhist, right? It's good or it's bad. But, and this is an idea which is really, as I understand it, more a later idea that developed later on when they started to classify these things into the Abhidhamma and that sort of thing. Yeah. But actually, uh, the way uh, the suttas talk about kamma, it's either black kamma with black results, white kamma with white results, or black and white with black and white results. Black and white is like gray, right? It's a mixture of the two. Huh? And this is the most common kind of kamma we make. And to be reborn as a human being, it is precisely black and white kamma with black and white results uh, that you have to do. And that's why you experience, as a human being, you experience a fair amount of problems in life, uh, but also a fair amount of happiness, right? It's kind of a mixed mixed state, the human state. So, um, yeah, so that, that's the... Um, yes? But it's the same thing, it's just another, another way of expressing it. Yeah, yeah, so basically good and bad intention, yeah, yeah. So white is pure, right? 
black is not very it's, it's the opposite. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I don't think it's true, actually. I don't think it's true. I think that is a is an exaggeration. I don't know where that comes from. It's not in the suit. It's, uh, it's, it's, it has become a kind of the, the, uh, the kind of the um, the thing people say. Uh, you know, it's the said thing that you know. Oh, you have to be human to kind of to get anywhere on the path, and that's the best place to be re reborn. This kind of thing. So, yeah. The last stage. Yeah, no, I don't think so. This, this is the thing, you know, you, you see in the suttas, you see the Buddha teaching the devas, uh, and often they, become all, they get all kinds of attainments as devas. Uh, this seems to be quite, quite common here. Uh. I don't think you have to be human. I think that's a big exaggeration. Uh. And people often make this aspiration, I'm going to be reborn as a human in my next life, otherwise I might not get enlightened, right? Uh, but I, I think that is, uh, I don't think there is any and necessarily any good grounds for saying that. I mean, if you get reborn as a human, there's a very big chance you will not be a Buddhist. There's all kinds of places you can be reborn, which are very hard to come into contact with Buddhism. And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm more in favor of just allowing karma to take its own course rather than trying to control things. Usually when you try to control things, you usually mess, end up messing it up anyway. That's usually what happens. So, so uh, yeah. Okay. And, but one of the interesting things here, I think, is that you have so there's two different ways of deciding whether something is wholesome or unwholesome, right? One is based on your intention. What is your motivation? What is your intention? You look inside of yourself and you think, okay, am I coming from purity or not? And the other one is to look at the result. Am I, am I doing something which is going to be for the happiness of other people? And sometimes you might think, that are those two the same or are they different? Is this the same thing here? To look at your intention here, as looking at the results? And it's not a straight away obvious, right? I mean, you might come from a good intention, but you might still hurt somebody else, right? You try to do what is right, but the other person gets hurt. So it seems to be maybe a clash here between the two ways of looking at it. Is there a clash? And I think, the, I think these two ways actually are not clashing at all. I think they are basically the same thing here. Uh, and the reason is, of course, sometimes you can actually hurt other people by what you do. But it's not, if you are coming from purity, it's not you who are hurting them. They are hurting themselves because of their own delusion or their own stupidity, I think. I think that's, where, that's the reason why it's happening here. So as long as you are doing what is right, uh, then you're also giving the other person a chance to, for, for you know, happiness to the, to the best of your ability. Yeah. But because you can't control their reaction, how they will actually act, uh, then sometimes they will be silly or stupid, even though you're doing what is right. Uh. So I think, basically, these are two sides of the same coin. As long as you are coming from purity, as long as you're doing what is right, uh, you are doing the very best pos possible to also uh, advance your own happiness and the happiness of other people. Uh. That is the best way of doing it. These are just two sides of the same coin. Uh. These two ways of looking at it. Uh. But of course, uh, I think also, if you do realize that uh, your acts, even if you're coming from goodness, and, but you realize that it might be misunderstood by the other person, they might take it the wrong way, then if you can adjust the way you do things so that you to minimize that potential problem, it's even better, right? Because uh, then you're actually creating even more good karma by trying to uh, find out the best way to help other people out in a difficult situation. Uh, yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that's probably probably true. <laughs> it sounds like a very human human kind of thing, doesn't it? You you are well intentioned, but it doesn't actually work out. So I think that's very. I think that's probably the case. But you just do your best, right? And then sometimes you, and then you learn from your mistakes. Okay, I was well intentioned. I did my best. It didn't work out right. Where did I go wrong? What can I do to change next time around? Right? You try to learn from what you do wrong here, yeah? and then you are on the right track. Yeah? So yeah, don't don't always expect your goodness to bear results. Sometimes you want to. But that's okay. You know, that in general, it will bear results. That's good enough. Yeah? There will be a general positive effect there. Yeah. yeah. It's very hard to be uh, to be. You know, very, it's very hard to be wise when you're deluded. Huh? So you have 
<laughs> this is the problem, right? With, with delusion, you can't really see it. Okay, so then when you see either, either in these two, and both of these ways are valid ways of thinking. Will I hurt somebody myself, or am I coming from defilements? These are both valid look, ways of looking at it, and some people would prefer looking at things in one way or the other. I think the most powerful, in the end, way of looking at it is actually understanding your defilements and knowing where you're coming from. Uh, that is probably the most, the best one. Huh? Okay, and then uh, when you do that, uh, then it will not do that sort of action if it is coming from that, but if it is not, then you may do such an action with the body. Okay, so then that's the actions of the body, then we have the actions of speech. Also, Rahula, while you are doing an action with the body, uh, you should, uh, yeah, you should reflect upon that same action thus. Okay, not, not yet. Speech comes later down. You should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Does this action that I'm doing with the body lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect... If you know this action that I'm doing with the body leads to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, it is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results, then you should suspend such a bodily action. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I'm doing with the body does not lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, it is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results, then you may continue in such a bodily action. So, you know, in other words, you reflect beforehand, you reflect while you're doing it, right? And if you find that you're doing the wrong thing while you're doing it, then you stop right there. You don't have a sense of pride, well, I've started now, I've got to continue, because otherwise I, I look strange if I sort of stop halfway. <laughs> You, but you actually say, wait a minute, you know, what is really important in life? Uh, important in life is to live a good life. This is what matters in the end. Uh, so forget about pride, forget about all those other things. Uh, I'm just going to stop this, what I'm, what I'm doing here. And if I look kind of silly to other people, so be it. Also, Rahula, after you have done an action with the body, uh, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Did this action that I did with the body lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both? Was it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the body led to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, it was an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results then you should confess such a bodily action. Reveal it and lay it open to the teacher and to your wise companions in the holy life. Having confessed it, revealed it and laid it open, you should undertake restraint for the future. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the body did not lead to my own affliction, or to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both. It was wholesome bodily action, with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. You can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. So you also reflect afterwards, after you've done the action. It's, you know, so uh, you're taking, taking morality very seriously here, right? Very, very seriously here. How can I actually change? How can I become a better person? This is kind of the focus of your life here. And of course, for a monastic, that you know, would uh, ho hopefully often be true, that that is the focus of your life. Uh, um, and then you confess it. And this is what I was mentioning before, that if you are an Aryan, uh, you cannot not confess something you have done which is wrong. This is a natural thing, because of a very strong sense of conscience. Uh, and uh, so this is what we do as monastics. If we have done anything that br uh, breaks the uh, Patimoka rules, then you have to confess it to one of your fellow monks. Uh, and you have to say, well, I've, I've done this. And you also undertake to restrain yourself in the future at the same, at the same time. Uh, 
And sometimes this can maybe be good to do as lay people as well. You know, if you've done something you feel is wrong, sometimes it can be nice to say it to someone perhaps. Uh, maybe that sort of helps you to to restrain or something. Yeah. If you feel like doing it, it's, it, maybe that means it's a good thing to do. Uh, Yeah, and then so th that is what you do, and of course that then helps you hopefully to avoid doing the same thing in the future. Yeah. But if you know that what you have done is a good act, then it says very nicely here that if you, if that's what you do, then uh, you can abide happy and glad, happy and glad, pampiti and piti and pamudja. I think are the Pali words here. Happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. So, in other words, training day and night in the states that you are already undertaking, in a sense, right? So that's what, what is going on here. So, uh, I think, let's ha have a quick look, if I can find this sutta. Um, um, yeah, piti pamujang are the two Pali, Pali words here. So, so the, the, the things that you that come as a result of acting in a good way is piti and pamuja. Pamuja means like gladness. Piti means rapture. Rapture is like often the kind of strong physical sensation of gladness you can get sometimes in meditation, right? Now these two words, piti and pamuja, are very important in Buddhism. And you find that when you see what is called, known as sometimes the a dependent liberation or transcendental dependent liberation, which is the chain of causality that leads to liberation. That chain of causality starts with virtue, right? And this is what we're doing here. We're looking at virtue. How can you be good in body, speech, and mind, right? This is all about virtue here. What happens next in that dependent liberation? If you are truly virtuous, the consequence of that is pamuja, is gladness arises. It's an automatic. The, the, the discourse even says, there's a beautiful discourse in the Indian Gutra Nikai, which says that if you are truly virtuous, you don't have to wish, may I be happy or glad. It happens as a consequence. It's a natural consequence. So very often, if you find that you haven't got enough happiness in the meditation, usually you have to look inside of yourself and ask yourself, is there anything I can purify more here? Is there something that isn't pure enough? Because that will be the thing that hinders you in moving forward. This is exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing the parallel between the virtue described in detail and the pamuja, which then is supposed to rise according to the dependent liberation. It's a natural consequence. You have to be happy if you're really virtuous. And remember, <coughs> very important, that virtue in Buddhism, you also see that here, includes the virtue of the mind, right? So if you have a mind that has, is, you know, gets, if you get easily upset and irritated by other people, that is actually uh, a non-virtuous state according to the uh, Buddha's teaching. So this is part of this, uh, the virtue of the mind. And when you do that, pamuja happens as a result. And this is what he's saying here. Uh, when you have these wholesome qualities, you can abide happy and glad. From the pamuja comes the piti. It's like a deeper sense of joy, uh, right? Rapture. Uh, and then from that rapture, the whole thing takes off. And this is where meditation becomes possible. Once you have that firm foundation in virtue, and happiness happen by, happens by itself, then meditation is possible. Because when you're happy, because of your internal state, it's natural to be mindful, right? Mindfulness is being able to be present in the moment. You can only be present in the moment if the moment is a happy moment. If the moment is good, it's easy to be here, present in the moment. That's why this type of happiness, which comes from your own virtue, it kind of forces you into the moment, right? Whether you want to or not. And of course you want to, because we all know that being mindful is actually very pleasant. So that's what mindfulness is possible. And once mindfulness is there, that's when meditation can happen. Without mindfulness, meditation is really a hopeless case. But once mindfulness is there, and then you watch your breath, and it's automatic. You don't have to use any willpower or anything. It just happens. So this path is very beautifully structured. And once you understand the structure, how this whole thing works together, it is very... It makes incredibly good sense, and I think we all know to some extent that this actually works as well. We all have some experience about this. So this is how it all comes together. And you can... It's also... 
very important here to recognize these little things, because if you're not used to reading the suttas, when, you say, when it says there you can abide happy and glad, training in wholesome states, you don't really understand what's going on. But this is actually a reference to that dependent liberation that you find across the suttas many other places. Uh, it's very useful to see that connection there. Uh, and then training day and night in wholesome states, well that means just anything, right? Uh, any practice you do which is good. Uh, yes? Oh, there is an additional factor, for sure. I mean, of, of course, if you sit down still, if you are in a peaceful environment, etc., all of those things will also help, right? But the point is that if you haven't got morality, you can sit as long as you like in a peaceful environment. It's not going to work. Your mind is going to be all over the place. So morality is the more important one of the two. And it's only if you're moral that going to a peaceful environment actually is going to have a good effect on you. Uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's precisely. So those, they have to go together, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as long as you're in a peaceful place, it doesn't really matter. The other stuff is just uh, quite irrelevant. Yeah. But of course, I mean, if you, have a, if you have a busy life, you know, if you have two kids, you know, <laughs> then of course it's going to be, you're going to feel stressed sometimes and restless and all this kind of thing. That's, that's just the nature of things. But then because you have the morality there and you're able to keep the, uh, the sila going, when you withdraw a little bit, you will find that you become peaceful re relatively quickly. Huh? Uh, that is, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. Good, good. Uh. Okay, so, um, yeah, so uh, then that is the body, and then we have the, exactly the same for the um, speech and for the mind. Rahula, when you wish to do an action by speech, in other words, when you wish to speak, you may do, such an, you may do it if you know that it leads to happiness and, and to uh, good results in the future, and that it has no affliction for others, for other people. Then you can do such an action, and if it leads to all the bad things, you should not be doing it. Uh, and then it's exactly the same thing. You should contemplate while you're speaking. Sometimes it's best just to stop mid-sentence, right, and say, oh, okay. <laughs> so, and then if, even if people say, oh, come on, you know, say it out, you say, no, okay, maybe this is not the right time or something here. Yeah. Because sometimes you catch yourself mid-sentence, right? Uh, that's what happens sometimes with me. I say, wait a minute, should I be saying this? Okay, better stop. Uh, and then also afterwards, uh, um, when you have spoken and you, you think again in exactly the same way here, uh, and then you will, again, you will confess it if you have spoken in the wrong way. It's part of the monastic training again. Uh, and if you're speaking well, then you can be happy and glad. You can have piti pamuja and train day and night in wholesome states. And the same thing with the mind, even with the mind, you should do the similar kind of thing here. Yeah. Right? I, uh, this may be, may be easier in monastic life, where you have a bit more space perhaps than in lay life, but uh, it's interesting that it's actually even mentioned here. Yeah. The only difference in this section is that uh, you don't actually have to confess it if you know afterwards you did a mistake, yeah, because you, you don't re actually have to confess mental, purely mental offenses. But sometimes even that can, can be useful. And I know of a couple of places in the monastic vinaya where uh, monks would go to the Buddha and actually confess a mental offense. Uh, and uh, it was a case where a monk was fault-finding in the presence of the Buddha. And then later on he walked, I think, 500 kilometers to find the Buddha and, and, and confess his offense. It's quite, it's quite nice, isn't it? It's quite kind of uh, beautiful, beautiful conduct. So, uh, this is... Uh, training in body, speech, and mind. And that is the virtue. And then you have the gladness coming as a result of that. Uh, and then from the gladness comes the pity, from the pity comes the tranquility, from which comes the deep sense of happiness, and from that comes the samadhi, the mind becoming unified. And from the samadhi comes the knowledge and vision of things as they are in reality. And that, of course, is what Buddhism, in the end, is all about.
Okay, Rahula, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past purified their bodily action, their verbal action, uh, and their mental action, all did so by repeated, repeatedly reflecting thus. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will purify their bodily action, uh, their verbal action, and their mental action, all will do so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Uh, Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present are purifying their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, all are doing so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Therefore, Rahula, you should train thus. We will purify our bodily action, our verbal action, and our mental action by repeatedly reflecting upon them. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Rahula was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, what do you think? Are you up for this? <laughs> it's a high standard, right? But this is good. It's a high standard. You've got something to work with. Which is not, not a bad thing. Yeah. Any, um, any questions? Any, anything anybody wants to say about this? Yes, John. Yeah. yeah. Even uttering um, falsehoods as a joke. Could you explain that a bit more? I I think it just means you know sometimes you you sort of lie to somebody thinking it's going to be a bit of a joke to lie to them. You know, you somebody asks, oh, where where is the way to? You know, to the main hall, and you say, "Oh, it's that way," and you point to the wrong direction as as a joke. You think it's just a, you think it's just for a laugh for yourself, but actually, it's it's a lie, right? Uh, I I don't think it. It doesn't seem to mean jo joking as such, like telling a joke, because when you tell a joke, you're not deliberately misleading anybody. Uh, lying is about deliberately misleading someone here, huh? right? This is what lying. The essence of lying is you want to mislead somebody. Huh? When you're telling a joke, you're not misleading anybody. You want to give them a laugh. Huh? It's a different thing here. Huh? So it's not about deliberately misleading here. A lot of the time the Buddha would also tell stories from the past, right? Lots of stories are being told, and I'm sure many of those stories are not literally true. They're often kind of edifying stories to make you understand the point of Dhamma. It's not a literal truth that is being told. And, you know, that's fine. Yeah? So, um. Thank you, Christina. Okay. Um, okay, uh, before I go on to the questions, I'd like to just very quickly to uh, read a little bit from the Madhyama Agama. So this is the parallel to the sutta in the, in the Chinese. It's, I'm not going to read it in Chinese because I, I, I have a serious problem reading in Chinese. And that's why it's so great to have the English translation, right? Uh, so this translation has been done in part by one of my monastic friends, Venerable Analayo, who is a German monk. Yeah? He lives in Germany and he does a, he is a very extremely gifted with, with languages, and that's why he, he does all this. He translates from Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, Tibetan, and, all, and he's really astonishingly uh, clever with languages. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just read a couple of paragraphs here, uh, just to give you some idea of the similarities. Uh, so he, here, this is the, from the Chinese then. The, the world-honored one is the Chinese version of the Blessed One, so you understand what's going on. Then the world-honored one, in other words, the Blessed One, the Buddha, took the water vessel, and having poured out the water until only a little was left, asked, Rahula, did you see me taking this water vessel and pouring out the water until only a little was left? Rahula replied, yes, I saw it, world-honored one. The Buddha told Rahula, in the same way, the practice of those who knowingly speak falsehood without embarrassment or regret, without shame or scruple, is of little worth, I say. Rahula, there is no evil they would not do. Therefore, Rahula, you should train yourself like this. Even in jest, I shall not speak falsehood. Right? So you, you see there how... It, Incredibly close it is to the Pali. It has all the same basic factors as in the Pali. Not to knowingly speak falsehood, without embarrassment or regret, right? without, without shame, same kind of thing. And uh, it says, there is no evil you would not do. This was also found in the Pali. And I will not even speak in jest, in other words, as a joke, right? 
and, and also the idea of the, of the simile of throwing out the water, and then there's three more similes uh, of overturning the uh, water vessel, which are exactly the same as the Pali. Then you have the simile of the elephant, that we had in the other one, also occurs in the Chinese. Uh, then it moves on to how to think about actions, right? Uh, and just briefly, I'll, I'll read this as well. Similarly, okay. Yeah, so first of all, uh, the Buddha asked Rahula further, what do you think, Rahula, for what purpose do people use a mirror, right? Venerable Rahula replied, world honored one, they wish to examine their face to see if it is clean or not. In the Pali it had reflection. The Buddha continued, Similarly, Rahula, if you are about to perform a bodily action, then examine that bodily action. Am I about to perform a bodily... I am about to perform a bodily action. Is it a bodily action that is pure or impure? Am I doing it for myself or for another? Rahula, if on examining it you know I'm about to perform a bodily action, and that bodily action is impure either for myself or for another, it is unwholesome, it has suffering as its fruit, it will result in the experience of suffering. Then, Rahula, you should abandon that bodily action that you are about to perform. But, Rahula, if on examining it thus, I am about to perform the bodily action, and that bodily action is pure, either for myself or for another, it is wholesome and has happiness as its fruit, and will result in the experience of happiness, then, Rahula, you should approve of that bodily action that you are about to perform. Right? So you can see the, the essential message is exactly the same as in the Pali. And then it goes on to say that you think about it while you do it, after you have done it, by, by speech and also by mind. Everything is the same as in the Pali. And then even the very last paragraph, the one about... Uh, Brahmin, ascetics and Brahmins in the past, present and future who purified their actions uh, did it in exactly this way, exactly the same as in the Pali. And what you will notice here that the main difference between the two suttas uh, is that in the Chinese version they've added some verses uh, and these verses are not found in the Pali and these verses are basically just uh, reiterating pretty much what the, uh, what the prose says. Uh, so you have the verses, that's an addition. And you also find that some of the details around it are different. For example, it says that um, Venerable Rahula was staying not at Ambalatika, but he was staying in the hot spring grove instead. Well, both are just different places in Rajagaha. Right? And it says that instead of the Buddha going to him in the evening, he went to him in the morning, right after arms round. And this is typical what you find. You find that the essence of the suttas are almost exactly the same between the Chinese, Tibetan, Sanskrit, Pali. But then when you look at some of the circumstantial uh, uh, material, the narrative, you find it often has a little bit different, slight, slight variations in that. Uh, and then there might be some additions like the verses and that sort of thing. That's what it really is. Uh. So this is how close it is. It is, almost, it is almost identical, I would say. That's, that's how close it is, these two, two traditions. Uh, and this is what I mean. You feel, wow, this really is uh, the word of the Buddha that we have. Uh. Does that make sense what I'm saying, everybody? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. 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 And the reason for that, if you think about that, you, uh, if you think back to how, how Buddhism started off, all the different Buddhist schools have this idea of the first council, right? When they all met together, they chanted the Sutta, they chanted the Vinaya. And if you remember, the description of the first council is uh, Ananda would, uh, would uh, recite the Sutta, and then the Kasapa would ask him, where, hap where did that Sutta happen? Uh, who was it spoken to, right? What were the circumstances? What that means, that all that circumstantial thing was added afterwards, right? And all the schools have that tradition. All the circumstance thing was added afterwards. And it makes good sense, because when you are present there, you're just taking in the discourse and remembering it. You're not thinking about the circumstantial details. That would always have been added afterwards, right? And that is what the tradition says it was added afterwards. And that is why, and precisely because it was added afterwards, that's why it tends to diverge between the different schools. So, it's, so it fits with the whole tradition of how these suttas were recited and how they got together. Uh, uh, 
I th well, the thing is that uh, some of the suttas may have been collected at the first council, others were collected later on. Uh, remember the Buddha laid down the four great standards. Uh, the four great standards are basically how to decide whether a sutta is authentic or not. Uh, uh, there is that famous passage in the first council, which is very interesting. There's a, a monk called uh, Purana. Remember that? You know, Purana? And Purana, just after the council is finished, Purana comes along, Venerable Purana. And, uh, and they tell him, oh, we've just been reciting the, the discourses of the Buddha, right? So you should, you should learn it in this way. Yeah. And Purana says, no, no, I have, I have learned the suttas in my way, and I will remember them in, in my way. That's what he says uh, Yes, right, right. I've heard it from the Buddha. I've heard it in this way from the Buddha. Yeah, or, or, yeah. So I will, I will hold to them in this way. And of course, that would have been the case. Many monks would have heard different suttas in different ways, and that would then have been added over time, right? So the first council, who knows? It may have been a very small thing. It may be only a, you know a few suttas, and then gradually it would have expanded over time. And as the school started to depart in different directions.